thank you for, for inviting me to this uh, this webinar. It's, it's a great honour. And I would, I would like to add to the comments made by Richard Allen earlier regarding Peter Morris, just to pay my respects to Peter. Also, I, I worked with him very closely since arriving in Oxford in 1999. Uh, he's a wonderful academic surgeon. He's a great man and he's a, he's a great friend. Uh, but even long before I moved to Oxford, when I was a junior doctor, actually in Cambridge, uh, one of his extraordinary attributes was knowing who everyone is. And that's something which Richard referred to earlier. He always knew who I was. As a junior surgeon, that, of course, is extraordinarily flattering. So, Peter, thank you very much for that. My topic is translation, uh, is research in kidney transplantation, and I decided to restrict this to translational research. I've only got 10 minutes to talk, uh, so I'm not going to cover the whole subject exhaustively. I'm going to just pick on a few areas which I think are of uh, interest, particularly of interest to transplant surgeons. Uh, the big, the big demand, the big challenge in the whole of transplantation, including particularly kidney transplantation, is this dis disconnect between supply and demand. That there are many more patients than there are donor organs. So we need to address the issues of donor organ supply and issues of long-term graft outcomes. So what can we do? I'm not going to talk about how we find more conventional donor organs. That's a separate topic, it's an extremely important topic, education, legislation, and we've just been hearing a good deal about this. What I am going to talk about are really two areas. One is to utilize more of the donor organs that exist, and that's by developing technologies to improve preservation, to improve assessment, and if possible, to recondition organs to improve their transplantability. And second, approaches to protect the organs that are transplanted, and that's modifications to the way we control the immune response and improvements in graft surveillance, how we monitor grafts. Graft organ utilization is a huge problem. So if we look at the United States, for example, which is the world's biggest transplant market at the moment, there are about 95,000 patients waiting for a kidney transplant. And yet 20% of all the kidneys that are retrieved from deceased donors are discarded. That's three and a half thousand kidneys which are retrieved from organ donors and not transplanted. That is a huge loss. And that's clearly a target which we should be addressing. We have to get used to the concept that high risk organs are, are reality. They're not going to go away. These data come from the United Kingdom uh, showing the proportion of kidney transplants that come from what we, would what we would define as high risk donors or high risk donor organs. This is based on donor risk index, various parameters which tell us that the organ is less than ideal. And as you can see over a 10 year period, the proportion of our transplants that come from these high risk organs is increasing and it's continuing to increase uh, so clearly something which we've got to get used to. If we look at the pathway of a transplanted organ all the way through from the donor in the, on the left side to the recipient on the right side, damage occurs at every point along the pathway. So in the donor, brain death is damaging. Warm ischemia is damaging, and that's particularly important, of course, in DCD donors. And periods of uh, cardiovascular instability leading to hypoperfusion are important. We then remove the organs and we cool them down. Cooling is bad for organs. Cold ischemia is bad for organs. And energy depletion, which results from anaerobic metabolism, is also damaging. We then implant organs. Uh, the process of rewarming accentuates the energy depletion because the organ is warming up and so the energy consumption is going up. And we then deliver warm oxygenated blood from the recipient at the time of implantation. And this causes a huge amount of damage in the context of ischemia reperfusion injury. And then in the recipient, during, the, during maintenance, the organ is attacked by the immune system, so it can reject. We treat it with toxic drugs, 
and we allow opportunistic infections. So there's a great deal that can go wrong to any transplanted organ. We need to protect that organ at all points along the pathway. So we need to look at ways of reversing the ill effects of brain death on peripheral organs, kidneys. We need to optimize tissue perfusion before retrieving the organs and potentially reoxygenate organs before we retrieve them. Pres uh, preservation, uh, avoiding cooling. There's a good deal of interest in avoiding or minimizing the exposure to cold. Supporting metabolism during the preservation and delivering oxygen metabolism, metabolism. During the process of implantation, we won't talk about matching donor and recipient, but we all know the importance of matching, ensuring that the HLA and other uh, matching criteria are met, but different approaches to blocking ischemia reperfusion. So this, this huge hit which occurs at the time of reperfusion can be mitigated. And then maintenance, we need to be looking, of course, are looking for non-toxic drugs. We need to look at immunomodulation rather than immunosuppression. And we need to look at better ways of monitoring graphs so we pick up on problems uh, much earlier than we do at the moment. So looking first at this area of organ resuscitation before retrieval, there's a lot of interest in what is called normothermic regional perfusion. This is specifically relevant in DCD, in circulatory death donors. And essentially what happens after the declaration of death is that the, the patient is put on cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, excluding the cerebral circulation. So there is either a clamp or a balloon in the thoracic aorta to enable perfusion with oxygenated blood uh, of the abdominal organs. And this has been used quite widely in abdominal organs, in livers and in kidneys. There's increasingly good evidence that livers benefit greatly from this with much better results from DCD liver transplants. But there is also evidence that this enables the use of more donors in terms of kidney transplantation. Uh, kidney preservation, so the next stage, if you like, in the pathway, there is a clear evolution from static cold storage in the top left, the old ice box, into hypothermic, that's cold machine perfusion. These devices have been around for many years, of course, and they're becoming increasingly sophisticated and more recently with the addition of oxygenation, which matters. And finally, into normothermic machine perfusion. And you can see here a device on the right, which is a normothermic prototype uh, kidney perfusion device. And the bottom left, a kidney which is undergoing normothermic uh, kidney perfusion. Uh, this is one slide which comes from a trial carried out, a European trial um, carried out looking at oxygenated hypothermic machine perfusion, demonstrating a clear benefit uh, with the, the addition of oxygen during hypothermic machine perfusion. The simple addition of oxygen improves graft function, improves graft loss, and, uh, and uh, uh, clearly adds benefit this is a trial which involves a number of European centers, has been presented, uh, will be published shortly. Normothermic machine perfusion recreates physiology, delivering oxygen, providing physiological temperature, providing nutrients, allowing metabolic activity to continue. This minimizes ischemia reperfusion. It enables organ recovery, particularly from hypoxia, for example, but other, other injuries too. And because the organ is uh, in a physiological environment, it can be tested to decide whether it's viable and suitable for transplant. This is the first publication on normothermic perfusion of a kidney. It's a, it came from the Cambridge group. It was uh, two DCD kidneys. They perfused poorly. No one wanted to transplant them. Uh, they were perfused on a normothermic machine perfusion system for 60 minutes. They were both transplanted and they both functioned. So that was the first published case. This is experimental evidence coming from the group in Toronto, demonstrating in a pig model that the shorter the proportion of preservation that is cold, the better. We can see here peak creatinine following a pig auto transplantation. The best line is the bottom one with 16 hours of normothermic perfusion. The worst line is 16 hours of cold and with varying um, degrees of damage in between. So clear evidence that warm oxygenated fusion is better 
than static cold storage. Uh, we, we believe that uh, it's, it should be, it, it's important to um, per, perfuse the organ for most, if not all, of the period of preservation. This is the device which we're just about to start using in clinical trial in Oxford. This is a device which is designed to perfuse kidneys ex situ for, up to, or for at least 24 hours uh, using human blood. So finally, and I'm aware of, the, aware of the, uh, the shortness of the time, a few words on long-term transplant outcomes. This attempt to reduce the late loss of grafts. This is looking at UK data, demonstrating something which I think we're all familiar with, which is that nearly all the benefits in terms of long-term graft survival in the last 30 years have been due to benefits in the first six months following transplantation. Thereafter, the rate of graft loss remains depressingly similar over the different eras. And you can see these, these, these uh, graphs, which are almost parallel after the first uh, six to 12 months. The first uh, a lesson which I think we have learned in the last 10 or 15 years is that we need to be cautious with immunosuppression. It is probably better to give less rather than more. This is a very, very large trial published in the New England Journal more than 10 years ago now, the so-called symphony study, which demonstrated that the best results in terms of controlling rejection come from low dose to chrolimus. Uh, and it's still better than all the, 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 the other approaches which have come since, which includes sirolimus. But the really important thing is that we're now using these drugs more cautiously, at lower doses. And this brings me to the, the concept of what we're going to do with the immune response. We've always seen the immune response as the enemy, something to be suppressed, something to be, to be pushed down. And we're now looking at what is called immunomodulation. So we're trying to, we're trying to uh, adjust the immune response. So if you like, it becomes our friend. Uh, it's, uh, it's a much less aggressive approach to the immune response. Uh, and this is work which has been carried out by a number of groups around the world, but particularly, of course, my colleagues in Oxford, Catherine Wood, Fadi Issa and others. And this is a major, major area of uh, translational research with us as well as with other groups. And the concept is, of course, that we all, we're all regulating our own immune responses all the time. And there are a variety of complex mechanisms about which we understand more than we used to. But one of them is the uh, so-called regulatory T cell. And normally, when we transplant an organ, the regulation is out is completely out, out um, weighed by the activated uh, cytotoxic response. So the T cells that are that are dedicated towards rejecting the transplant grossly outnumber the regulatory T cells, which are trying to pers persuade them to be a bit less aggressive. And the concept here is to trend is to translate this into a therapeutic approach. Uh, whereby T regulatory cells uh, are amplified in terms of the population to get more of a balance between the cytotoxic cells and the regulatory cells. And hopefully this should lead to a lower requirement for immunosuppression. There is very good experimental evidence for this. Show, this shows a, a evidence from a humanized um, mouse model, again coming from, from the Fadi Issa, Catherine Wood group, demonstrating the addition of uh, amplified T regulatory cells in this model can prevent rejection of human skin onto a humanized uh, mouse. And there's also good evidence that this technology prevents transplant vasculopathy. You can, you can see here the difference in the cross section of a, of a blood vessel in, uh, in animals with T regulatory cell therapy. So this is going forward into clinical trials. We've just, we have completed a large um, uh, collaborative project throughout a number of European and American centers, a phase one study of regulatory T cell therapy. We're now into a phase two study. So this is a much larger study with controlled patients. And what happens, this is living donor kidneys. They give some, uh, the, the, the recipients give blood. The T regulatory cells are separated, stimulated, expanded, and then given back to the patient following transplantation at the time of transplantation or sometime shortly afterwards. This is a trial which has only fairly recently started to recruit patients, but we're really very excited that this may lead to the ability to improve long-term outcomes and reduce the morbidity 
associated with immunosuppression. And finally, apologies for running over slightly, graft monitoring, really important. How do we, how do we know that our transplanted organs are in good shape? How do we re detect rejection before there is irreparable damage to the transplant? A lot of interest worldwide in donor-derived cell-free DNA as a way of monitoring uh, organs. Uh, lots of questions, more questions than answers about specificity and sensitivity and whether this technology can discriminate from other causes of injury like drug toxicity and infection. How often does it need to be done? How complex is it? How much does it cost? Well, this is one of the earlier publications coming from the group in California uh, in 63 kidney transplant recipients, suggesting that it is quite a useful way of monitoring um, transplanted kidneys. It's not an ideal study. It was retrospective. It was relatively small. And it de demonstrated that it's probably more useful in picking up antibody mediated rather than cellular rejection. But just, I think, just a taste of uh, things to come. So to conclude, there are lots of research initiatives addressing every point along that transplant pathway, which I showed earlier. We're in a very, very exciting era where basic science is feeding into clinical innovation. The complexities of introducing uh, innovation in clinical practice, really complex. Clinical trial design, critically important. The regulations around clinical trials, increasingly uh, rigorous for all sorts of good reasons. Uh, but it's a very exciting uh, place to be. Thank you very much for your attention.